Whether you're a 40K veteran or you're just discovering this universe for the very first time through the awesome new first-person shooter Darktide, you may find yourself with a lot of questions. What exactly is an Inquisitor? And why are we serving them? Who is this god emperor that every character keeps talking about? And what's with that creepy monster man hiding in each of the Medicaid stations? Well, today we're gonna get to the bottom of that, as the developers of Darktide Fat Shark reached out to my channel to sponsor a lore video for newcomers. In this video, I'm gonna answer all of the common questions that new players tend to ask, as the background story of Darktide and the larger Warhammer 40,000 universe is truly incredible. Super bleak, grotesque, depressing, and unflinchingly brutal, but incredible nonetheless. There's over 30 years of lore that the game is built upon, and something like 600 published novels. The game throws a lot at you really quick, and making heads or tails of it for a brand new person can be pretty challenging. I'm here to break it all down into a simple piece-by-piece -piece guide that will help you understand most of the characters, themes, and enemies that you will find hiding in the lower depths of the Hive City, while also doing my best to not overwhelm you with too much superfluous information. If you haven't started playing yet, Darktide is now available on Steam, and I can honestly say it's one of the best 40K games we've gotten in a really long time. It perfectly captures what it's like to be a regular human in the grimdark future of Warhammer 40,000. You're not gonna see any space marines or anything like that here. Just regular people with a job to do and a whole lot of angry poxwalkers. And with all that out of the way, let's dive headfirst into the grimdark. What exactly is the Imperium? In the grim darkness of the 41st millennium, humanity finds itself in an age of constant war. Mankind is beset upon on all sides by those who would seek to bring about the extinction of our species. Every day, hundreds of thousands of battles are fought across the million worlds of the Imperium, a galactic spanning empire that has existed for over 10,000 years. This is an age where enlightenment has been replaced by superstition, understanding by rhetoric, and uncomprehending prayer. Mankind has seen peace for the lie that it is and has abandoned all pursuits of a better future to instead focus on a never ceasing war for survival. The Imperium is the single largest and most powerful empire in the history of the human race. Its influence spans across a million worlds. And although the total human population is absolutely impossible to truly calculate, it is believed there are quintillions of humans currently living within its borders, the vast majority of whom have pledged their hearts and souls to the eternal service of the God Emperor, the master of mankind. The domain of the Imperium is divided into many different segmentums, systems, and sectors, but it's viewed by its citizens as a singular entity, united in a common belief that the galaxy belongs to mankind, that the Emperor is the one true God, and that even in his silent vigil upon the Golden Throne, he still watches over and protects humanity from the evils of the universe. Each planet operates as its own independent fiefdom, their governors ruling as they see fit, so long as the tithes demanded by the larger Imperium are continued to be met. For every new world claimed by the exploratory fleets, many more are lost to violent and unpredictable warp storms, Xenos raiding parties, or demonic incursions. To defend its territory, the Imperium utilizes many different military factions, including the genetically modified super soldiers of the Adeptus Astartes, the golden demigods of the Adeptus Custodes, the righteous warriors of the Sisters of Battle, the estimated 30 trillion soldiers of the Astra Militarum, and the extensive war fleets of the Imperial Navy. They are aided in battle by their closest allies, the Tech Priests of Mars, along with the many Forge Worlds under their control, and their legions of towering bipedal god engines known as Titans. The armies of the Imperium fight to protect all of its worlds while pushing back the myriad threats that lurk in the dark corners of our galaxy. They are trapped in a never-ending war, despite not having any rational hope for victory. The Imperium doesn't fight for a better tomorrow. It doesn't send its armies across the stars for concepts like honor or freedom. It does so only in a desperate bid for survival. These are dark times where desperate measures need to be taken in order to ensure humanity's continued existence. The Imperium must be as ruthless and cunning as its enemies, and to combat the monstrous, they in turn must be even more monstrous. This is a quote from the beginning of almost every Warhammer 40k novel that summarizes exactly what it's all about. To be a man in such times is to be one amongst untold billions. It is to live in the cruelest and most bloody regime imaginable. These are the tales of those times. Forget the power of technology and science, for so much has been forgotten, never to be relearned. Forget the promise of progress and understanding, for in the grim dark future, there was only war. There was no peace amongst the stars, only an eternity of carnage and slaughter, and the laughter of thirsting gods. Who is the God Emperor? 
The Imperium was created by an individual, collectively referred to as the God Emperor of Mankind, an immortal being known as a Perpetual that has walked amongst our species in secret since 8000 BC, guiding humanity from the shadows until he eventually revealed himself in the year 30,000. He is the undisputed master of mankind and the greatest man to have ever lived. He was a being of immeasurable psychic might and one of the most powerful entities that has ever existed in our universe. He was a master of every conceivable form of study and elevated humanity to a point of technological superiority not seen since the shadowy and long forgotten period known as the Dark Age of Technology. A time when humanity had finally reached its golden age before the impossible machines that the people of the time period had come to rely upon turned against them, and the kingdom of man was burned to ash. All of the planets they had conquered being separated from one another for thousands of years, leading to a dark, isolationist period of our history known as the Age of Strife. The Emperor was the man who led humanity out of that darkness and united all of Earth under a singular banner of the Imperium. He is the creator of the Custodians, the Primarchs, and the Astartes, the Emperor's Angels, the Space Marines. It was him that led the Great Crusade, an effort to reunite all of the human worlds once again. He has spent the last 10,000 years on life support, entombed upon the Golden Throne after being mortally wounded by his traitorous son, Horus Lupercal. Despite his fervent claims that gods did not exist and that mankind should place their faith in science instead of false deities, without him there to directly interfere, his worship ended up spreading like wildfire. The church that honors him as the one true God, often referred to as the Ecclesiarchy, has become the dominant state religion of the Imperium. And his worship is not something the citizens get to just choose to participate in. Worship is mandatory. The humans living in the Imperium believe that the Emperor continues to watch over and protect them, even during his silent vigil upon the Golden Throne, even though no one has seen or spoken to him in the last 10,000 years. What is the Inquisition? Within the institutions of the Imperium, none are perhaps as mysterious as the Inquisition. They operate in the shadows and their influence is as far reaching as their considerable power is absolute. They are the Imperium's secret police, rooting out heresy no matter what form it takes. Inquisitors are granted the right to requisition whatever assets or military forces they may require to complete their missions, whether that take the form of deploying their own private armies or even unleashing the awe-inspiring destruction of exterminatus, the cleansing of a world through orbital bombardment, cyclonic torpedoes, or virus bombings. This is a last resort type scenario, and it only happens if the Inquisitor deems the corruption they encounter upon the world's surface has sunk its roots too deeply to be sufficiently excised. The multiple ordos of the Inquisition's ultimate job is to ensure the Imperium's survival through any means necessary. Such an enormous burden is carried out by the utterly merciless and rigidly devoted servants of the Emperor known as Inquisitors. Their authority is absolute, seen as being granted by the God Emperor himself, and to deny them is to embrace death. To an Inquisitor, no door is locked and no asset is barred from their acquisition. For them, failure is not an option. Most people don't even know the Inquisition exists, and those that do speak of it only in hushed whispers, for even the most faithful of the Emperor's flock would be wise to do everything in their power to not draw the attention of his Inquisition. Although often believed to be a singular massive organization, the Inquisition is actually made up of many smaller branches known as Ordos, the three major Ordos being Hereticus, Xenos, and Malleus. The Inquisitors of Hereticus are specially trained in the ways of the heretic, each member of the Ordo being a master witch hunter. The Inquisitors of Ordo Xenos, however, focus their pursuits on combating the alien menace wherever it may appear. Well, those of Ordo Malleus, possibly the most secretive of all of the Inquisition's Ordos, specializes in the study and eradication of demons. Inquisitors are noted for being incredibly strong-willed and self-sufficient. However, many do employ groups of hand-picked operatives who have demonstrated proficiency in particular skill sets or knowledge bases. This is the story of our player characters within Darktide, as we have been given a second chance to redeem ourselves for our past crimes by serving the Emperor once more under the Order of the Inquisition. What is the Astra Militarum? The Astra Militarum is the largest cohesive fighting force within the galaxy. There are an estimated 30 trillion guardsmen currently enlisted in active fighting service within the Imperium of Mankind, and countless millions of them die every single day. The men and women that fill the ranks of the Imperial Guard are recruited from every one of the million worlds within the Imperium, making them an incredibly diverse faction. From the fearsome jungle fighters of the death world of Katachan, the highly disciplined Mordians, or perhaps most iconically, the soldiers of the fortress world of Cadia, 
these are but a few of the many different fighting forces within the Guard. Their tactics, uniforms, and equipment are all representative of the world that they were recruited from. The men and women of the Astra Militarum are highly disciplined troops, indoctrinated to follow orders without question. They stand firm in the face of the enemy and respond to their bellowing charges with steady aim and volleys of burning glass fire. To be a soldier within the Guard is to be a regular human staring down a universe of alien and heretical horrors. Alone, a single human fighter is no match before many of the most iconic enemies within Warhammer 40,000, such as the ancient and undying Necron warriors, the brutal and savage orcs, or the heretical forces of the traitor Astartes. But their greatest strength comes in their discipline and numbers. Thousands, if not millions of guardsmen will stand united to push back these heretical evils and defend the Imperium of mankind with their lives. The guard is often forced to fight in grueling wars of attrition that can last years or even decades, and it is unfortunately inevitable that huge swaths of these men and women will die in service, uh, most of them not making it through their first year. However, if there's one resource that the Imperium of Man seemingly has an unlimited supply of, it is that of human soldiers. For every guardsman that dies in battle, 10 more stand ready to take their place. What is a veteran sharpshooter? Although it's uncommon, the guardsmen who manage to survive through their first year end up as some of the hardiest and most resilient soldiers who have ever fought for the Imperium of Man. The veteran fighters are the first squads to engage the enemy and the last to retreat. These are the people who have escaped countless ambushes, regularly navigated minefields, or fought against a vast menagerie of alien and demonic evils. It's pretty common for these heroes of the Imperium to be attached to units of fresh recruits, the legendary tales of their deeds inspiring the men and women they fight beside to new levels of implacable bravery. The skills they have gained over their long careers being taught to the less experienced soldiers. Each veteran excels in all aspects of warfare, from brutal close quarters combat to long ranged engagements, they are all intimately familiar with heavy demolition work, and each one is an expert marksman. They may be assigned to more special operations, where their unique skills are either better suited for or are simply wasted in the infantry masses on the front lines. Wherever a veteran ends up, there is one thing that remains true for all of them. Only in death does duty end. What is a Psyker? A Psyker is an individual with the incredible ability to manipulate reality by channeling the energies of the warp. Now, because of their innate connection to such a place, rogue psychers are often seen with a massive amount of mistrust by humanity. They are labeled as witches by the Emperor's faithful and hunted down by the forces of the Inquisition, the Sisters of Silence, or even the planetary police forces known as the Adeptus Arbides. The warp has the ability to corrupt anything it sinks its tendrils into, and psychers are the most vulnerable to this, as they have a greater connection to the Immaterium than any other. It's not an uncommon occurrence for psychers to either become vessels of demonic possession, or whether intentionally or unintentionally, bring about the collapse of entire worlds through the inability to fully control their powers. Every day, thousands of psychers are rounded up and taken to the throne world of Holy Terra to be sacrificed to the Golden Throne, a device that keeps an enormous relay known as the Astronomicon lit as well as housing the body of the Emperor of Mankind, who uses his immense psychic powers to hold back the tides of chaos. Over the last 10,000 years, the Golden Throne has begun to fail, and the Emperor's psychic might alone is not enough to keep it functioning. The psychers who are to be sacrificed are plugged in like batteries and have their essence drained to further power the throne. The persecution of psychers is seen as a grim necessity in these dark times. As if the Golden Throne was to ever fail, it would certainly mean the extinction of our species as we know it. Not all psychers meet such a terrible end, however. Uh, many of those who are rounded up may just still prove useful to the Imperium. Such individuals will be instead entered into the Scholastica Psychana, the training division of the Adeptus Astartes Telepathica, where they will be trained to harness their abilities for the good of mankind and have their minds hardened against corruption through years of strict training and hypno-indoctrination. Those who would find success here will become known as sanctioned psychers, and they will fill roles within the Imperium dependent upon the powers that they manifest. The recruit may be trained as an astropath, or if they are young enough and display a particularly unbreakable resolve, they may just be inducted into a space marine chapter as a librarian. Many more, however, will find themselves serving along the ranks of the Astra Militarum where they will be trained in the art of channeling their destructive warp-based abilities against the enemies of mankind. When it comes to the psychers who would be inducted into the Guard, they commonly take two different forms, Primaris psychers and Weird Vein psychers. The Weird Vein psychers are far more common and have not yet obtained the rank of Primaris. However, quite often due to their madness and lack of control, this is a rank they may never achieve. 
These individuals can still harness their abilities to serve the God Emperor by working as a group. Such psychers will be forced to undergo years of grueling training before they will finally be given the go-ahead to be unleashed upon the battlefield. Once the order is given, the group of psychers will work as a squad, channeling their powers together to create absolutely remarkable and terrifying acts. The communion will draw its strength from the warp by linking their thoughts together, multiplying each of their individual powers. Lightning crackles all around them, and moans and wails spill from their lips as they cause enemy vehicles to crumple around them like tin cans in an ogren's fist. Hordes of heretics will be engulfed in billowing clouds of psychic flame, while the heads of elite enemies burst under the torrent of raw, barely restrained psychic force. The group can whisper tales of madness into the minds of their enemies to frighten and confuse any that they would face on the battlefield. Primaris Psychers, however, are exceptionally rare individuals who have mastered their abilities and can single-handedly manipulate their destructive powers with but a single thought. These Psychers can summon forth cascading waves of psychic lightning from their fingertips that rip through the enemy ranks, shorting out their synapses and causing flesh to melt from their bones. Now, each is capable of a wide array of different psychic disciplines and is an invaluable tool against the arch enemy. However, despite their numerous accolades and many great deeds, these psychers will always be viewed with a mixture of awe, superstition, and fear. Their presence is seen as abhorrent to many high-ranking generals, and their abilities will always be viewed as blasphemous sorcery. Regardless of a psyker's rank, they will forever be subjected to the uncompromising scrutiny of the Inquisition, and will always walk a fine line between service to the Emperor and eternal damnation. No matter how much training they've had, no matter how sufficiently the Imperium has indoctrinated them or hardened their mind against the predators of the warp, every time they manifest their powers, they open themselves up to demonic entities that swarm to their souls like moth to a flame. Most Imperial Psychers are outfitted with an array of neuro-wiring and complex microcircuitry that is either embedded inside their head surgically or strewn throughout their protective gear. These devices are designed to bleed off excess psychic energy and protect them from the consequences of channeling the warp. Well, neuroinhibitors limit the possibility of possession. However, there is always a chance that these devices will fail. Or even worse, a psyker will give in to the temptations of chaos and cast off the proverbial shackles that the Imperium has placed upon their mind in a pursuit of power at any cost. Heretical sorcerers that have no limits placed upon their abilities are incredibly dangerous foes. Crazed madmen that would sacrifice everything, including their own souls, for the power to burn away all those that persecuted them. What is a zealot preacher? The priesthood of the God Emperor has taken sacred vows to always uphold the Imperial Creed, while his holy servants fight with great fervor and ruthless determination to enact his will across the galaxy, tearing foes to bloody ruin while bellowing hymns of praise to the master of mankind. Preachers are often the lowest ranking members of a clergy, responsible for overseeing the worship of a single region or district of a planet. Their job basically has two main components. The first is to make sure that the worship of the God Emperor is maintained by the citizenry of the Imperium. And the second is to relentlessly root out heresy wherever it may appear, both roles being pursued with equal zeal. Many of these preachers do not actually have any form of military training, but they make up for this with fearless religious fervor, throwing themselves into the midst of the enemy with roaring chainswords set to unleash righteous butchery in his name. Their savagery and inhuman acts of bravery are all inspiring to the humble masses, thus stirring the most unlikely band of civilians to unite into a fearsome fighting force. The preachers are the bane of the heretic, the mutant, and the witch, and will relentlessly pursue all those that blaspheme in the God Emperor's kingdom. They may not have the physical strength of an ogren, the military training of the soldiers of the Astra Militarum, or the innate psychic abilities of psychers, but their unwavering faith in the Emperor is perhaps even more powerful than all of these things. Not only does it grant them a seemingly supernatural resolve to see them through even the most dangerous of missions, but in the Warhammer universe, if faith can sometimes manifest into very real miracles. Blows that should induce mortal wounds, leaving nothing more than a faint bruise. A person near the point of complete exhaustion, suddenly gaining a righteous second wind that propels them once more into the den of devils. Or shots from trained marksmen simply glancing off of their armor. To the zealots, faith is stronger than any steel and a more powerful weapon than any firearm. Some preachers will take to the stars and spread the Emperor's light to the darkest corners of the galaxy, while others may accompany the Adeptus Sororitas during their wars of faith. 
fighting at the forefront of the sisters' holy crusades, their words and deeds calming the hearts of frightened soldiers near the point of breaking, or conversely, driving them forward into a fevered killing frenzy. What is an ogren? Although many people wrongfully assume that ogrens are a different species to humans, they are actually one of many different groups that are collectively referred to as abhumans. This group includes the short, excellent marksmen known as ratlings, the stout and hardy kin of the Leagues of Votan, the various different strains of beastmen, and even the three-eyed psychers known as navigators. Abhumans get a pretty bad rap within the Imperium, as they are seen by the general public as being mutants. It's important to note that not every Imperial citizen holds such discriminatory views, but the belief is unfortunately pretty widespread. Ogrens, however, possess a myriad of traits that the Imperium deems as pretty useful. What they lack in intelligence, they more than make up for in raw physical strength. Each Ogren is a three to four meter tall mountain of muscle that is capable of awe-inspiring feats of strength and endurance. Although Ogrens appear big and scary, uh, most of them actually have very kind hearts. Well, kind when it comes to those they call friends. Ogrens are aggressively loyal and would follow their friends through hell itself to keep them safe. Woe be to any that would hurt those an Ogren cares for. When they're drafted into the Imperial forces, most of the jobs they are given are relatively simple in nature, such as direct assaults and headlong charges into battle. The instructions have to be very simple. Go here and smash the bad guys. Break down this wall so the troops can get inside. Or protect the Commissar at all costs. Ogrens get confused easily, and a frustrated Ogren can be incredibly dangerous. A couple of fun facts for you about Ogrens. The first is that although Ogrens seem like they wouldn't be afraid of anything, they are notoriously claustrophobic. So it makes it really difficult to actually transport them into battle as coming in in a transport vehicle or via drop pod makes them incredibly nervous. The other is that one of their most iconic weapons, the Ripper Gun, is often outfitted with a special burst limiter, specifically because a full auto version would run out of ammunition incredibly quickly in the hands of an Ogren, as they tend to get pretty excited when they get into battle. What is a hive world or a hive city? The million worlds of the Imperium are incredibly varied, each serving humanity in a different way. Planets known as Agri-Worlds are entire planets dedicated to the production of food to feed the quintillions of Imperial citizens. Some of these worlds have fields of grain that stretch as far as the eye can see in every direction, or animal grazing pens the size of continents. Many worlds are designated as mining worlds, as such planets are abundant in natural resources, and their smaller population will be completely dedicated to stripping the world of every last mineral before the desecrated husk will eventually be abandoned. There are what are known as fortress worlds, whose entire surface is a dedicated military complex, located in key positions of strategic importance throughout the galaxy. Uh, there are even shrine worlds that serve as holy positions of emperor worship, each and every one of them attracting untold legions of pilgrims every year, and thus serving as economic hotspots. Hive worlds are the most heavily populated planets within the Imperium, and are dotted with massive, sprawling cities collectively referred to as hives. Each hive is a massive industrial complex, built up over thousands of years, new cities constantly being built on top of existing ones. You can think of a hive as cities on top of cities on top of cities, each one being built upon the remnants of the one that came before. Hive cities are so inconceivably large that each one can almost be seen as an entire world within itself. They house millions or sometimes billions of people, with the wealthy ruling classes living in the spires at the top, while the dregs of society live in the lower levels. Even deeper still, are the dark worlds of the Underhives, collapsed, desolate remnants of ancient human civilizations that have gone unnoticed and undisturbed for millennia. These dark depths are insanely dangerous, and only the mad and insane would choose to dwell here. The deeper you go, the more bizarre and dangerous it becomes, the dark corners of the Underhive becoming breeding grounds for all forms of monstrosity and heretical worship. What is a Servitor? Throughout your play experience in Darktide, you will inevitably encounter several strange and twisted individuals that, despite their horrific appearance, will end up offering your character aid. These include the headless speaker in one of the game's opening cutscenes and the Medicaid stations found throughout your journey into the Hive City. These creatures are known as Servitors, and they are possibly one of the darkest things in the vast lore of the Imperium. A Servitor is a cybernetic drone created through the fusion of machines with a lobotomized human. They act as indentured servants capable of carrying out simple tasks. There are many different ways that an individual can end up as a servitor, but the most common of which 
is that they were once criminals who couldn't possibly carry out a sentence to redeem themselves in a single lifetime. By being turned into a servitor, they continued to serve the Imperium even after their death. This may seem pretty grotesque, but there's a reason why these people are used. You see, artificial intelligence, or abominable intelligence as it is more widely known, is strictly and unequivocally banned throughout the Imperium. Machines that can think for themselves are seen as heretical, and this makes sense, as experimenting with such technology almost led to the extinction of the species thousands of years ago during the Dark Age of Technology. By having a creation such as a servitor still technically being controlled by an intact human brain, this skirts the line and is deemed as an acceptable necessity. The individual will be mind wiped, cybernetically enhanced, and reprogrammed to serve specific functions dictated by the tech priests who create them. Many of them end up working as repair units that can enter areas too dangerous for living humans, such as toxic or heavily irradiated environments. Although servitors are technically still alive, all semblance of who they once were has been completely erased. They are no longer considered a person, just a morbid robotic servant of mankind. Despite this, there have been persistent rumors that possibly due to an error in the process of creation or an intentional vindictive act of the tech priests they offended during their lifetime, it is said that some servitors remember everything of their previous life and are still fully aware, trapped in a body they can no longer control and forced to live forever as they carry out menial tasks for their controllers. Whether or not these rumors are true remains unclear. What is the warp? Within Warhammer 40,000, there are two parallel universes, the realms of the physical and that of the immaterial. We exist in the physical universe, whereas the immaterium is a dark reflection of that. It is a realm of energy and emotion rather than tangible substance. And you can think of it like this. Every thought, idea, feeling, or emotion that you have ever experienced creates residual energy within the warp. And the warp is made up of the collective energy generated by every sentient being that has ever or will ever exist across infinite planets and infinite galaxies. Over the millennia, this place has gone by many different names, the Immaterium, the Warp, or the Sea of Souls, just to name a few. Across space and time, thousands of different cultures have revered the Warp as the place that we go when we die. And there is some truth to this, as every living creature has a footprint within the Warp, linking us between the two different dimensions. This is what many people refer to as a soul in Warhammer 40,000. Millions of years ago, when the galaxy was mostly at peace, the Warp was, by all accounts, a tranquil place. However, in the age of endless war, the emotions of fear, anger, treachery, and excess have become dominant. And thus, over time, the warp has twisted into a hellish and hostile dimension. It is an incredibly dangerous place and utterly inhospitable to human life. And if one were to stare directly into it without any kind of psychic training, they would most likely go insane. They would see the stuff of nightmares, images of swirling, elongated faces of the infinite dead, and themes and concepts the mortal mind was never meant to comprehend. It is a place where the laws of our universe have no sway, Time, physics, reality are nothing more than profane suggestions here. It is a great irony that humanity is completely dependent upon it in order to continue existing, as their ability to engage in faster than light travel is only possible by using specially designed devices aboard their ships to rip a hole in reality and travel through this disturbing and unnatural dimension. They're basically taking a shortcut through hell. Navigating the Sea of Souls is incredibly perilous, but through the use of specially trained abhumans known as navigators, a massive beacon of psychic light known as the Astronomicon upon the throne world of Terra itself, and artificially generated pockets of reality around the ships known as Geller Fields, warp travel remains possible. Without these elements, a ship that entered the Sea of Souls would quickly become lost in its swirling tides or smashed apart in the myriad of violent warp storms that could be found there. What are the Chaos Gods? Since the dawn of time, similar emotions have pulled together within the Immaterium, and particularly strong emotions like anger and wrath, pride and lust, deceit and treachery, and fear and disgust have all coalesced together, the combined energy of these similar feelings being generated by infinite living creatures eventually swelled to ludicrous proportions and gained sentience. At first, these formless entities just developed rudimentary consciousness, but as they continued to grow in influence and power, they eventually emerged as the ruinous powers, the Chaos Gods. Each one of them is an incalculable psychic presence within the warp, generated by the collective fantasies and horrors of mankind. Eventually, 
these eldritch beings gained the ability to reach back through the veil between universes, entering our realm through the thoughts and dreams of mortals, their influence growing stronger over time as they sought to manipulate our universe as well as their own. The Dark Gods see a living creature as nothing more than a piece on a board, and our universe as the setting for what they call the Great Game, where each of the four gods compete against their siblings to eventually be the one to enact its complete and utter ruination. The four gods include Korn, the Blood God, Lord of Murder and Violence, Zinch, the Architect of Fate, Lord of Arcane Knowledge, Slanesh, the Dark Prince, or She Who Thirsts, the God of Excess, Depravity, and Hedonism, and Nurgle, the Grandfather, Lord of Plagues and Pestilence. Each of the Chaos Gods grows more powerful as their influence spreads. Those who worship them behave in ways that feed their patron more power, and thus are rewarded with mutations and insight into forbidden secrets. Many other followers of Chaos view the Primordial Four as a pantheon, each god representing a different but important piece of a larger whole. The Chaos Gods are constantly warring with one another within the realm of Chaos, and while they fight for dominance, their followers wage unholy wars in real space to further the goals of their patron deities. The followers of Chaos take infinite different forms, but most iconically within Warhammer 40,000, we see the enemies of mankind take the form of the traitorous Chaos Space Marines, the blasphemous tech priests of the Dark Mechanicum, and the infinite different arrays of mortal cults. Within Darktide, we see two different factions, the Scabs and the Dregs, the Scabs being mostly made up of traitor guardsmen, while well, the Dregs are the mortal followers of Nurgle. Who or what is Nurgle? Nurgle is the lord of plagues and pestilence, of death and rebirth, and is the god of choice for the dreg enemies that we encounter in Darktide. Nurgle is unique amongst the dark gods in that he truly loves and cares for his blessed children. Albeit, the way he shows that paternal affection is by blessing his followers with ever more virulent diseases and mutations. Each and every blight, sore, and pustule is prized amongst his faithful as a generous gift from the Grandfather. His followers seek to spread his bountiful blessings across the galaxy and exist as a festering sore within the Imperium, rotting it from the inside. It's an unequivocal fact of the universe that nothing is immune to entropy. Everything will inevitably come to an end, and all things will eventually rot and decay. But through death, new life emerges, and Nurgle is the embodiment of this cycle. From the bodies of the slain spring trillions of new bacteria, and with them bloom ever more virulent diseases. Nurgle is the creator of every plague and infection to have ever swept through the physical universe. And despite his morbid nature, it may come as a surprise that Nurgle is portrayed as a joyous and jovial god. For him, blessing a world with rampant infection is a display of his generosity, and he is often deeply offended when mortals reject his kindness through the use of medicine. Nurgle represents the fear of death shared by all living creatures, the undeniable truth of our own mortality. He is the embodiment of the fear of disease and decay, and teaches his followers to embrace despair. For to lose all hope and accept the cycle of life and death as inevitable is the only way to reach true enlightenment. Imperial hive cities are a breeding ground for Nurgle corruption, for wherever there are mass graves, large populations living on top of one another in filth and squalor, and death and disease are allowed to run rampant and unchecked. It is in these neglected corners that Nurgle worms his way into the minds of men. He promises them salvation through death and enlightenment through rot. Who are the dregs? Nurgle's followers have become so twisted by his teachings that they end up abandoning their old lives, their ethics, morals, and any pursuits that once held meaning to them, to instead travel the galaxy, spreading his unholy word, each one of them acting as a patient zero for an outbreak of demonic diseases that spreads across new worlds with a malevolent sentience. One may find themselves asking why someone would choose to follow such a god. And it's important to remember that although many Imperial citizens hold tightly to the Imperial Creed and the salvation promised by the God Emperor, uh, many more feel abandoned by him, uh, many of whom have never received a single shred of mercy and are forced to live in brutal and violent conditions. For the teeming masses, their lives are not their own. Their lives belong to the Imperium, and their value is measured only in what they are able to produce for the Imperial War Machine. Many of these individuals will become disillusioned with such an existence and seek to become the masters of their own destiny. Through their research into the darker corners of forbidden lore, they may just come across the trilobe symbol of Nurgle, their curiosity propelling them down a path of damnation that ultimately sees them trade the shackles of the Imperium for those of another, far more disturbing master. The dregs, as they are referred to in Darktide, are individuals who have given themselves over mind, body, and soul to the Lord of Decay, 
They are his beloved and pestilent children, and have received many of the grandfather's blessings. Each of them have been given inhuman strength and resilience, and barring having their brains bashed in, are functionally immortal. Their rotting bodies able to shrug off mortal wounds that would kill normal men and women each one teeming with countless afflictions, diseases, and infections. They are his plague legions, his blessed children, and through his teachings, they will see the Imperium rot. What are Pox Walkers? Within the dark depths of the Hive City, our characters will encounter many different forms of Nurgle heretic, the most numerous of which being the shambling hordes of Pox Walkers, individuals afflicted with a terrible disease known as the Walking Pox. This disease progresses by killing the body but leaving the mind intact, and eventually the individual is reanimated and forced to attack those they once called brothers and sisters, all while being unable to control their own bodies. They must bear witness to the horrific acts they are forced to commit under the commands of the Chaos Champion that afflicted them, all the while tears streaming down their face, framing a wide, rictus grin. In battle, their shambling hordes overwhelm and engulf their enemies in a rotting tide of decayed and pestilent flesh, conscripted soldiers forced to fight as the frontline meat shields of the pestilent parade that is the armies of Nurgle. Although their story is admittedly quite tragic, we can take solace in the fact that by mowing down hordes of them in the game, we are doing them a great service by blessing them with the Emperor's mercy, freeing them from the hellish prison that has become their own body. What is the Beast of Nurgle? Although all of the entities that Nurgle uses in war are admittedly quite tragic, the Beast of Nurgle are by far the worst. You see, a Beast of Nurgle is a full-on demon of the Plague Lord. Not a human infected with a terrible disease like the Poxwalkers, a symbiotic fusion of human and demon like with the Demon Hosts, or a grotesque and monstrously corrupted creature like the Plague Ogrens. Beast of Nurgle currently are the only actual demon that we face in Darktide. You see, demons can't exist in the physical universe for very long. It requires an incredibly powerful summoner anchoring them to our realm of existence, or continuous and sustained acts of blasphemy. Although there are many different types of Nurgle demons, the Beasts of Nurgle stand apart from their siblings and have an almost joyous and jovial personality. They are very simple creatures by nature and have very limited intelligence. It's said that their personalities are similar to that of a Labrador Retriever. They have no interest in war or fighting or anything like that. And when they attack us in the game, they are literally trying to play with us. The Chaos Space Marines aligned with Nurgle, known as the Death Guard, will often bait the beasts of Nurgle into charging into the enemy ranks by getting their attention with their vehicles and then speeding off in the direction of the front lines. The simple and jovial creatures are excited to play a game of chase, uh, much like how real dogs like to run after cars. At the very last second, the tank will veer in a different direction and the beast will collide with the enemy soldiers. They mistake their terrified screams for excitement and the running of soldiers and the attacks against them as a sign that these tiny creatures want to play with them. Unfortunately for those that find themselves in combat with such a creature, playing often takes the form of the beast devouring them, whipping them with their tails with such force that they shatter every bone in their body or vomiting corrosive and necrotic bile into their ranks. Once the enemy has been completely destroyed, the beast will nudge their broken and corroded bodies, not understanding why they're not moving anymore. They take this as a sign that they are being ignored and that these people no longer want to play with them. This is heartbreaking to the beasts, and over time, a sense of resentment can begin to brew in their hearts as they find themselves being rejected in a similar manner over and over and over again. Eventually, this will reach a breaking point and the beast will be completely heartbroken. They'll then lumber away from the battlefield and find a swamp to crawl in and die. They will then begin to pupate in a cocoon of hatred, all of the joy that was characteristic of the Beast of Nurgle being replaced with only vindictive hatred of the living. They will then mutate into a far more horrific creature known as a rot fly, but we'll cover those if they ever get added to the game. What is a demon host? So, as I touched on briefly before, demons cannot exist in our universe except for under very specific circumstances. Now, oftentimes the forces of chaos will create an unholy abomination known as a demon host, where one of the Neverborn will be forcibly bound within the body of a living human, their frame becoming nothing more than a flesh puppet, bound directly to the will of the blasphemous parasite that has infected them. The reason that this is done is because demons technically don't actually have any type of physical form. They are creatures of the Immaterium, meaning they are made of nothing but raw energy. 
The flesh and blood of the mortal that they are bound to then serves as that physical shell that the demon needs in order to exist in the physical plane. When a cult or a powerful chaos sorcerer creates a demon host, they will commonly utilize lesser demons, as these creatures are still incredibly powerful and the keepers of forbidden demonic secrets. The more powerful the demon that is bound, the more difficult they are to control. Even though both the summoner and the demon host serve the same deities, it is a common mistake to think of them as allies. Demons are spiteful, hateful, and vindictive creatures, none of which would ever serve a human willingly. To bind a demon in such a way is to make an immortal enemy, that the moment the summoner loses his concentration, the creature will descend upon them and rip their still beating heart from their chest. Many of those who would become hosts for a demon are willing chaos cultists. They see merging with one of the Neverborn as nothing less than a grand apotheosis into a higher being, whereas many more are unwilling sacrificial fodder that the cult has captured. Regardless of how they are made or what demon is utilized in the binding, all demon hosts are incredibly powerful and dangerous foes that are best to be avoided at all costs. What is a Plague Ogren? As I mentioned earlier when speaking on Ogrens, they are powerful yet simple people whose raw physical strength is rivaled only by their unshakable loyalty to those that have gained their respect. What's truly tragic about them is that oftentimes, that trust can be severely misplaced. For if an Ogren swears to follow someone they call a friend no matter what, and that individual ends up walking the path of chaos, it is an inevitable conclusion that the Ogren will follow them into the darkness. Plague Ogrens are Ogrens that have been subjected to such a fate. They are hulking in hideously twisted masses of bloated and diseased flesh, each one sporting a different array of twisted mutations. Their already incredible strength and resilience is amplified even further by the generous gifts of the Grandfather, and in battle they are nearly impossible to kill. Not only are they living battering rams that can lay low entire platoons single-handedly, but each Plague Ogren is also a breeding ground for ever more terrifying diseases and demonic parasites, spreading corruption and plague with every step that they take. Those who would somehow manage to defeat such an abomination would quickly find themselves showing symptoms of diseases so terrible that being crushed to death by a Plague Ogren would have been seen as a better fate. Who were the Scabs? The scab enemies encountered in Darktide are made up of former soldiers of the Astra Militarum who have spit upon their oaths to the Emperor, traitors and deserters who for a myriad of different reasons have found themselves walking the eightfold path of damnation. Most often larger groups of traitor guardsmen will enlist themselves in the service of dark gods through a powerful champion of chaos. These blessed individuals can take the form of a charismatic demigod, a person who has become possessed by one of the denizens of the warp, or in some circumstances, a member of the heretic Astartes themselves. When a regiment defects to chaos, it's not just the group of soldiers that is lost, but so is all of their vehicles and equipment as well. Despite their ruthless training within the guard and all of the indoctrination they are subjected to, Chaos is incredibly clever and manipulative, and mortal men and women, regardless of the position or role they find themselves in, are never completely immune to its whispered temptations. Some may defect to escape their regimented and restricted life within the Imperium, while others may seek to become powerful warlords in their own right. Whatever the case may be, these groups are one of the largest fighting forces in the collective lost and damned souls that make up the mortal fighting forces of chaos. Whereas the majority of dregs were most likely not militarily trained before gaining the blessings of Nurgle, the scabs have a background full of extensive military training, meaning that they are highly disciplined, organized, and incredibly dangerous. Although in the game it's not inherently obvious which of the gods the individual scabs have dedicated themselves to, it is far more likely that they follow the tenets of what is known as Chaos Undivided, where all of the gods are equal portions of a pantheon, each representing a different facet of chaos that are all equally important. Their training and access to sophisticated military weaponry makes them a very important piece of the Chaos fighting force, laying down volleys of suppressing fire as hordes of poxwalkers and other mutated Chaos monstrosities descend upon their enemies in an implacable wave of rending claws and gnashing maws. I can't prove this, but it's most likely that they provide all of the sophisticated weaponry that their Nurgle blessed allies, the Scabs, bring into engagements. As net guns, grenade launchers, flamethrowers, and military grade sniper rifles are not something that regular citizens of the Imperium would normally have access to. So this video was pretty broad, and we covered a lot of different topics. Unfortunately, Darktide's lore isn't exactly spelled out, and it's a game that the developers have been promising us that is going to evolve over time. 
with new bits of the story being added in in future updates. So for this video, I was mostly just pulling from my own personal knowledge of 40K and trying to keep it simple as not to confuse all the new people who are just discovering this universe for the very first time. There's still a lot that we don't know about the story yet, like what the ultimate goal of the different chaos cults on Tertium actually is. And hopefully we'll see some of the other gods get mixed in in the future. Because as much as I like Nurgle, he's my absolute favorite of the four. I, he does have a tendency to show up in the video games a lot more than all of the other gods. So far, I've been really enjoying this game and I'm super excited to see where it goes from here. But what do you guys think? Are there any important details that I left out of this video? Is there anything that you're still confused on? And what's something that you personally hope gets added to Darktide in the future? I think I'm gonna make another lore video like this next time we get a big update that has some major story implications. Because with how ridiculously vast the lore of Warhammer 40K is, there's a lot of different directions they could go. So I'm definitely really excited to see where they decide to take it. Anyways, thank you all very much for hanging out with me today. Day, and I'll catch y'all in the next one.